Nowhere in the scripture does it teach that you had to search and pursue happiness. You find happiness as you do your duty. You find happiness as you lead a disciplined life before God. Nothing else can fill it. Marriage can't fill it. Drugs can't fill it. Sex can't fill it. Alcohol can't fill it. But the person of Jesus Christ can fill it. Hey Amen. That, um, that truth is really where we're centering our time and attention this morning, that Jesus is the one whom life is all about. Um, and this morning, as Pastor Joe mentioned, we'll be in Philippians chapter 1, and our intent is to spend time in verses 12 through 26. So if you have a, a Bible or device by which to access those scriptures, I encourage you to grab it. Um, we'll have some things up on the screen to help us navigate this time together, but the scripture I'd love to leave to you. I'd love for you to grab a Bible or a device and track with me as we navigate these passages together. Um, but if I were to give a, I don't know why we always do this, but I think it's helpful. It's helpful for me. If I were to give a, a title to our time together for this morning, here's how I would entitle our time together. Catastrophe or catalyst. Catastrophe or catalyst. Say, so what do you mean by that? I don't know. Hang out with me for the next 40 minutes. And hopefully we'll land on a point that I feel like the scriptures drive home in verses 12 through 26 of chapter 1 in the book of Philippians as it relates to circumstance that's challenging, people that are challenging. And there's a cons- we're not really sure how to pronounce this word. Crises? Crisis? What's, what's the proper way to say crises when there's multiple? See, nobody knows. So we're just going to say it together. Crisis. There we go. Challenging crisis, challenging people, and challenging circumstance can either be catastrophic to your joy or the catalyst to make it concrete. That's up to you. And how you will respond to the truth and the reality that Jesus is alive, that he has conquered sin, death, and the grave, that sin does not have a hold upon you. He has broken the power of sin in your life. That's the truth of the gospel. That's why it's called good news. Here's good news. You don't have to be bound to that addiction in Jesus' name. Here's the good news. You don't have to lose your temper. Here's the good news. You can change. How? Well, I believe Paul and the letter that he wrote to this church that he hadn't seen in 10 years church that was ever so dear to his heart, church that started miraculously, he shares the truth that Jesus, Jesus is the key to joy. Jesus is the key to life. But let me ask you a question. What gets you going? There's a guy on staff here who uses this phrase, what cranks your tractor? I'm not familiar with that phrase. Uh, but I don't have a tractor, so I don't know. Nothing, I guess. But what gets me going, I guess, is the best way I know how to say that. Or like, is it a Starbucks drink in the morning? Who knows? I remember a season. You know, people come into your life for a season and a reason. It's always for a season, though. No relationship is forever. Only the relationship with Jesus is the one that endures. But I'll never forget this season. This season where I had three little girls, Lily, Lucy, and Layla. And I took them all on a bike ride by myself down Main Street, Destin. And this is a picture after that wonderful time. Smoothie King. There's Lily. Gracious, Lily must be. If Layla is down there at the right and looking at the age that she is, this has to be somewhere around seven years ago. But there's Lily, there's Lucy, and there's Layla. I remember that day. Because on that day, the one on the lower left, little Lucy, the red-haired, blue-eyed girl, she used to have a morning rhythm that if you did not obey that rhythm, you would pay the consequences. 
And this was the rhythm. Early awake, 5 a.m., something of that nature. Orange juice, plain Cheerios in a cup, and Lady and the Tramp. If you did not obey that rhythm, there were consequences to pay. That's what got Lucy going at the age of two or, I don't know, seven years ago, maybe three. (sighs) Seasons, they come and they go. But more than that, though, not just a morning pick-me-up or a routine or something that you look forward to, but what drives you? What are you all about? When people hear your name mentioned, what priorities and passions pop into mind? And let me ask you this question. What must it be for you to endure, to have resiliency in your joy? Because life is hard. There will be challenging circumstances, challenging people from within and from without. And there will be crisis. So what must be the priority, the passion, the perspective, the bullseye? Look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Paul begins to share what I believe we must have to have this resiliency. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, he said, well, what's happened to him? Last week, Pastor John shared that. Philippians chapter one, verses one through 11. Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook Live, check it out if you've missed it. What happened to me has really served. Oh, circumstances are subservient to this individual. How, How does he say this? They have served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Father, I pray as we simply look at your word this morning, that you by your grace and spirit would speak your truth. Lord, you'd help me to just get out of the way. And Lord, I ask that you would be center stage in our hearts and in our minds. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. The master passion of Paul's life was Jesus, knowing him and making him known. Let me say that again. His priority, his passion, his purpose, the way everything was EQ'd in his life was to know him and to make him known. Paul saw his his life, his ups, his downs, and all being in the hand of God. In our time together this morning, we'll learn how Paul navigates challenging circumstances, challenging people, challenging crisis. He knew that no matter what happened in life, God was the one writing the story. See, listen, circumstance, please don't miss this. I want to read it to you as it's written because I won't be able to accurately do it ad hoc, but Circumstance is only subservient to those whose perspective is singularly, accurately about Jesus and what he wants. Let me say that one more time. Circumstance is only subservient to those whose perspective is singularly and accurately about Jesus and what he wants. If you choose another worldview or philosophy, like even moralistic deism, where you maybe attend a service and you know that there's a deistic God and you live morally, you are subservient to the circumstances of your life because you're at the center of it. You will remain subservient to your ever-changing circumstances because they change. 
But sometimes we can lose that perspective, right? Like I have kids. Right now I have a two-year-old named Leonidas. Oh, he just turned three. August, he turned three. So we'll ask Leo at daily devotions or at Sunday after church, like, gee, what did you, what did you, what, what was it all about? And we try to say the G, 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 to get him going. Oh, I know what the answer is, Dad. Jesus, right? What did you learn about in class today, Leo? Jesus. Who do we love, Leo? Jesus. Who do we serve, Leo? Jesus. But let's be honest. In your teenage, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, however long the Lord gives you, it's easy to lose the simplicity of that. It's so easy because you're inundated with so many false teachings every single day. So many false gospels. This is the good news. This is the good news. Career, vacation, health. That's the good news. If you have health, you can. It's easy to lose the simplicity that it's all only and always about Jesus. So so my question is simply this. How do we not lose that? I think it's a dynamic in life that you walk in balance, that you don't solve that problem. You manage it. Say, what do you mean by that? What can we do? Are are we doomed to live the rat race, to live life on a loop where it just feels like every year it's the same thing? I don't think so. I think it starts with the gospel. Understanding it accurately is one of the greatest needs in the modern church, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That Jesus would say, unless you're willing to die, you're not worthy of me. That you would understand that that salvation is not an additive to your life, but it's a surrendering of life. Where it's not Jesus take the wheel, it's Jesus take over. You are in charge. What you say is what I say. Where you go is where I go. You are Adonai. Lord, you're Lord. I think this is one of the greatest challenges that you and I face in the 21st century. We we live in a world that that just peppers us with this perspective that life must be about you. And if it is not, then you're missing it. But that is not the gospel. It is his story, not yours. When you surrender... God, I'm yours. I'm wholly yours. Then he can make you holy when you're wholly his. I'm yours. And then you proclaim and declare that through baptism. Why is that important? Because salvation, let me see your eyes if I can, is a mystery. It's a miracle. It is a miracle that John Spencer is alive. I can say that as his son as an individual who grew up in challenging circumstance, challenging people, crisis all around, and God radically saved him and used him for 38 years to faithfully shepherd a congregation in his hometown. That's a miracle. That doesn't happen often. I I survey many churches from one ocean to the next. That's a rare story. That, That someone starts well serves well, and is finishing well, that's a rare thing. It's a rare thing. It's a miracle when someone transitions from death to life, from darkness to light, from lost to helping the lost find home. That's a miracle. It's a miracle, it's a miracle, and it's also invisible, yet we need the visible. I think that's why baptism is so important. Because salvation, God knows those who are his. I don't, you don't. We see fruit, but you and I aren't the Holy Spirit. It's actually not our job to discern wheat and tares. That's the Lord's job. But baptism is this public profession, declaration, celebration, proclamation, appropriation, identification that Jesus is Lord. You understand the gospel 
You confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and then you publicly declare that truth through the waters of baptism. Well, then what? If I'm trying to manage this mindset of keeping Jesus the center, I think you begin to grow. You begin to grow. You, You begin to daily get into his word. You begin to tell others about what Christ has done in your life. You begin this journey where he becomes more and more of your Lord every single day. And then you get introduced to a community that is not just you, but you gather with God's people to love him. You group with God's people to connect and build one another up. And you go with God's people to live on mission. If you live that kind of lifestyle, gospel, growth, gather, group, go. One day you will be gone, but you will have lived a life that has meaning and value both temporally and eternally. And your life will no longer be on loop, but a journey, an adventure. Right, Bilbo Baggins? Isn't that the way life's meant to be lived? I think it can be. I truly do. You see, verses 12, 13, and 14, Paul is navigating difficult circumstance. He's there to die in prison. And not only is he circumstantially in a tight spot, but the people around him aren't all that awesome. Look at verses 15 through 19 with me about navigating challenging people. He says, some indeed are preaching Christ, listen to this, from envy and rivalry. Know that that still happens today. But others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ only out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer. I love that. That confidence that he has, that through prayer, Christ will deliver. And the supply, he says in verse 19, of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer. I love that. He's confident. Now, I don't want to belabor this point because I think most of us would agree That in life, I don't think we need ample illustration or maybe some way to get us in alignment, but there's challenging people in life, right? This section right over here. Have you guys ever met anyone that's challenging? Oh, they're pointing fingers over here on the front row. (laughs) This section over here. Anyone in your your life ever go, man, there's a little bit of friction there, a little bit of contention, a little bit of we're not aligned. Yeah. Yeah. If you're breathing, there's challenging people, right? Because you're challenging. So like if you put yourself in a room long enough, you'll probably disagree with yourself long enough. See, that guy knows. But like, there's challenging people. So what do you do? Well, Paul's focus is singular, right? He's not necessarily about just getting out of a situation where no longer do people challenge him because that place is called death. That's finally where that happens for you. Finally, no one's bugging me. Well, you're not alive, though. (laughs) That's never, ever going to happen. And you don't really want it to happen. Because challenging people are oftentimes the greatest instrument in your life in the hand of God to make you more like him. But what do we do with this passage? There's a necessity for that singleness of mind, like he says in verse 18. He says, like, only in every way, whether in pretense or truth, here's what I'm stoked about. Christ has proclaimed. It's about him and them. It's about knowing him and making him known. That is happening. So I'm good. I'm good. But I I would ask this question. How do we not become those people? How do we not become someone that we get into our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and look at the mirror and go, I don't know you? nor do I like you. How do we not end up there? 
How do we maintain a resiliency in our joy? I want to tell you a story of magic, if I can. Say, magic? What do you mean? Pat Riley is regarded as one of the best coaches in the NBA. And there was a season when he was the LA Lakers coach when Magic Johnson played. And Riley says that Magic, when he was in junior high, his basketball talent was obvious, so much better than all the other players that he would score upwards of 50 points while the rest of the team would score five, and they would win. But there was no team. There was Magic. Riley tells the story that there was a time in his life, Magic Johnson, when he made a change. He would become the enabler, passing the ball to others to make them look good. The story is told that Magic only played two years in college before going pro, and the team that he arrived upon had a team of superstars, but they weren't winning. Great players, they were playing for themselves. So Riley says that Magic became the catalyst, and he decided to make the other people around him better. He went to Byron Scott and said, I'm going to make you the number one scorer on this team. I'm going to pass you the ball, and you're going to score. And he did. He went to James Worthy and said, why haven't you ever made the all-star team? I'm going to make you an all-star. Started passing the ball. The next thing you know, he's on the all-star team. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar scored the most points in the history of the NBA at that time, and before he broke the record, Magic Johnson said, I want to be the guy who passes you the ball when you make that record-breaking basket. And Riley records that on that night, when it was time for Jabbar to break that record, Magic got off the bench, dribbled down the floor, passed the ball, and as the ball went through the hoop from Jabbar's shot, The record was shattered. And this is what Riley says. I'm just going to quote him. If you look at the video of that event, you'll see Magic Johnson leaping into the arms of Jabbar. And if you look closely, you'll see tears streaming down his cheeks. Riley said, Magic was the most unselfish basketball player I have ever seen. Who is the most challenging person in your life? If you have a mirror, you're looking at him. Jesus is Lord of the one that you think of, gosh, that person. But if you spend more and more time with the Lord, I'll never forget a pastor that was on staff here named Steve Feely. He used to say, you know, Neil, when I first came to know the Lord and he started changing things in my life, like taking away smoking or drugs or promiscuity, whatever it was, he said, I likened it to like being in a room of this kind of size. And I had these huge beach balls of sin in my life that the Lord was deflating. I'm like, Lord, look at what you're doing. And as I began to walk with the Lord more, I felt like the room was now full of basketballs, you know? Like, oh no, I thought I was navigating. Like, look at all this other stuff going on internally that the Lord's doing. He says, the longer and longer I walk with the Lord, I see that the room is actually filled with thousands of golf balls. So many things that the Lord is still doing in me and through me. The Apostle Paul has that digression if you know your New Testament. As he wrote the writings that he shared with the early church, he would say, oh, I'm the least of the apostles. We know where he would land. I'm the chief of sinners. The more closely you stick with Jesus, it's this bizarre thing. You realize that you're forgiven and free, so your joy is settled. But you also realize, Jesus, I need you for every waking moment. I need you to change me. I'm not yet who I'm supposed to be. But thank God I'm not who I was. It's this tricky balance with the Lord. See, one person said this way, if that works for basketball, unselfish play, could it work in the church? That when the gospel is preached by anyone, even with poor motives, you're good with that. This author writes this when he considered this story. He said, I think the overarching principle might be stated like this. A critical attitude is catastrophic to joy. But a gracious 
attitude is its catalyst. Here is one of the greatest marks of a mature person. Gratefulness. Thankfulness. Because you are not owed September 12th. It's a gift to you. Those kids you have that drive you crazy. You're not promised another day with them. Steward them well. Your spouse is a gift to you. Wives, respect your husband because he deserves it. Because you're obedient to the Lord. Men, die to your hobbies. Die to your passions. And live for your wife. Love her sacrificially. Can you imagine if children were obedient to their parents as unto the Lord? And that would be amazing. But like, can you imagine what it would be like for a husband and wife to love and respect? Can you imagine citizens that prayed for their governing authorities and recognized God is in control? The government you have, God knows about, and he put there. So trust him. Stop complaining. Stop pointing the finger. Stop being critical. And move forward. Move forward. There are people in Gulf Breeze and Navarre and Midway that are dying and going to hell. You are called to go into 32563, 32561, 32566, whatever zip codes are here, and live on mission with the good news of the gospel. The gospel. That is your mission. That is the purpose of your life. Challenging people can become catastrophic to the lifestyle of joy or the catalyst. It's your choice. It's up to you. As Wearsby would say, the secret is a singleness of mind. It's about Jesus, knowing him and making him known. Look at verse 18, where he would say, What then? Only in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice as he's chained, facing a death sentence. That's amazing. And that joy is available to you and I. I say, go for it. Go for it. But there's also a crisis. Look at verses 19 through 26 where he says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full of courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I live in the flesh, that means fruitful label for me, which I shall choose. I cannot tell, for I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to part and to be with Christ, for that's far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Do you pick up on almost like the personal crisis going in within, within this guy? It's like he's going through something. Obviously, physically, he's in jail. But even internally, he's like, I just don't know. Is it better to live or die? I mean, have you ever been in that place? His circumstances are tough, but here's what I want you to see. What's most interesting to me about this passage is the confidence that exudes from Paul. If you look again at verses 19 and 20, listen to what he says. I know through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but I will be full of courage. And whether it's through life or death, I'm going to honor Christ. Man, I don't know that I would be writing those words. I'd be like, I pray to God this works out. Like, <laughs> I'm hoping you're praying for me. Um, could you please send some extra clothes or food or something? Because in that time, friends were the ones that had to provide for the rations for a prisoner. But if you look at Paul, he's like, I know this is happening. It's my ex expectant expectation. Whether it's life or death, I'm not going to be ashamed. 
I mean, who is this? The Christian Cassius Clay? Is that what's happening here? Like, is he like, I'm going in, you know, I'm going to like float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Is that what he's thinking? I don't think so. Is he a super like egotist in the latter days of his life? No. No. You know what he recognizes here? There's two things I want to draw your attention to, and then we're going to close. There are two things in this passage versus, oh, what is that, 19 through 26, that mark this kind of supreme confidence in the midst of crisis. Here's the first one. It's probably something you've never heard of before in church. Prayer. You ever heard that word before? Okay, a couple of us. All right, well, he knows he's being prayed for, and it gives him confidence. Why? What are the real powers that we face? Was it Nero in the Roman Empire? Or was it the spiritual dynamics behind it? He knows that prayer has its most potent and powerful effect, more so than anything else. Prayer is the spiritual weapon. Let me say that again. Prayer is the spiritual weapon that can bring down strongholds and bring into captivity everything that is against the knowledge of God. Prayer. I heard someone once tell me, Neil, you may not be able to preach with the best of them, sing with the best of them, but you can pray with the best of them. And to be honest with you, that's more potent and more powerful than the other. Prayer. Listen to what um, Pastor Chuck Smith said of prayer. He says, prayer is the most important activity a born-again Christian can perform. It should head your list of priorities. For certainly the world around us desperately needs prayer. Prayer will open the door for God to do a glorious work in these last days. Prayer will stem the tide of evil. Jim Simbola the author of that great book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, said this, the devil is not terribly frightened of our human efforts and credentials, but he knows his kingdom will be damaged when we begin to lift up our hearts to God. Martin Luther said this, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of his willingness. D.L. Moody said, the greatest need of the church today is more of the presence and the power of the Spirit of God. Oh, that Christians were roused to greater earnestness and importunity in prayer. I believe the greatest revival the church has ever seen would result. God, help us, each one, to be faithful in doing our share. R.A. Torrey said this, when the devil sees a man or woman who really believes in prayer, who knows how to pray, and who really does pray, and above all, when he sees a whole church on its face before God in prayer, he trembles as much as he ever did, for he knows that his day in that church or community is at an end. Corey Ten Boom, last quote, prayer is powerful. The devil smiles when we make plans laughs when we get too busy, but he trembles when we pray, especially when we pray together. Remember, though, that it is God who answers, and he always answers in a way that he knows is best for everyone. Why are connect groups so important? Because we can't think of anything else to do in the middle of the week. No. No so that you would become a PhD in Bible study. Not really. So that you would build a community where you can come before God and be real with God and real with one another. Where you can pray with and for one another in an informed way, in a relational way, in a way that I believe has real impact. Prayer. Why? Is prayer like the magic? You know what prayer is? It's just a surrender to God. God, finally, you just do what you want to do. We're talking to you. We're relational with you, but we just want to be like PVC pipe. God, you do it, and we'll just kind of let it happen through us. Prayer. Gatherings are a wonderful time for us on a Sunday morning where we gather to love God. 
And there's kind of like a monologue prayer. I mean, maybe you're like praying while you're singing. That's awesome. But like maybe you come up to the prayer teams. I think that's great. But praying on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday throughout your day, grouping together to pray for specific things in your personal life. It's where like the rubber begins to meet the road of growth in your life, a group. Man, I couldn't more highly encourage you to continue to gather with us on a Sunday morning and to continue to group with one another throughout the week. You say, how do I do that? Check out the Connect Desk. There's 30 or so groups that you could get connected in or just go online and find one to connect with. God has so much for you that's going to come through the vehicle of relationships with him and his people. Joy will stay resilient as you stay in community. See, here's what Paul recognizes. People are praying for me. Man, I'm so thankful. I had 24 texts this, mess, this morning from different pastors from all over this region that said, Neil, I'm praying for you this morning. I need that. They need that. You need community. Paul needed that when he was in prison. He said, I'm so thankful. You know what encourages me? I know my people are praying for me. My group, they got me. See, not only is Paul confident in the power of prayer, but also the resources of the Spirit. Look at verse 19. He says, I know that through your prayers and through the help of the Holy Spirit of Christ Jesus, one author says that that word help in the English is kind of a feeble translation. It should be more like resources. He says, I know that through your prayers and your resources of the spirit of Christ, that this will turn out for my deliverance. Let me quote to you something that Pastor David Guzik says about this passage. I love what he said. He said, it was not the prayer of the Philippians in and of itself that would meet Paul's need but it was the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ that came to Paul through the prayer of the Philippians. Paul's needs were met by the spirit of God, but his provision to Paul was brought by the prayers of the Philippians. Do you see that? That like God's ministry is meant to work in and through people, relationships. I mean, the Philippians, they're not the ones to give Paul joy, peace, that, that ability to be confident. Christ is. He's the hope of glory. But oftentimes, ministry is missed if you don't engage. God wants to do so much in you and through you. Just take a first step. Begin to follow him. For Paul, it was all only and always about Jesus. And that's why his life is settled. Look again with me at verse 21, if you will. He says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. What does he mean by that? What do you have to experience before you can say, finally, I'm living? What do you think living really is? Or, or what would you possibly substitute the word Christ for in that verse. Well, what do you mean? Like, for me to live is security and safety, and death is to lose that. For me to live is to be known and respected, and to die is to be memorialized. For me to live is wealth and pleasure now, Because to die is to cease to exist. Like, what do you functionally believe? Do you know what I mean by that? By like the way your calendar is actually organized, where your money is actually going, where your time is spent primarily. The only thing that makes sense is what Paul says. For, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul's desire is to be with Jesus, but he knows that a life lived here and now produces great fruit. This isn't a morbid desire for Paul to die because life's hard. 
This is a sincere desire to depart. I love that word in the Greek, like to depart and be with Jesus. That word depart means to be like pulling up camp by loosening the tent ropes and moving on. It also means setting sail by pulling up the anchor and loosening the ropes or unyoking an oxen and releasing them from the burden of their work. Like if you've walked with the Lord for any length of time, you know what that means. Where your heart says, I just can't wait to see the face of the voice that I followed through this life. Can't wait to see you. Can't wait to be with those who've gone ahead of me. But I must live now. This is where God has me. He's like he's saying this, that life is worth it. Run your race, he would tell Timothy. Heaven's worth more, but life is worth it. There's so much to experience in Christ and with his people. As one who has surrendered to him, while he's alive, he's going to live. I heard a quote, I don't know who this is from, but I think the quote goes something like this. You only live once, and if you do it right, it's enough. Like, you don't want to go to heaven without any scars, right? You want to live. You want to live. With life, I say go for it. Pay attention to rhythms. Make sure you rest and you have sustainability. But live it to the hilt. And I'm telling you, following yourself is not the way to live. Maybe there's pleasure in sin for a moment, but it's just a moment. I'd rather have life now and forevermore. That just makes sense. Then it's Christ. Die to yourself. Live for him. It'll be hard at first and forever, but the more you live for him, the more you realize, I'm so thankful I don't have to know that I'm not in charge, that it's Christ who's leading. I'm so thankful that he's the one that gives joy and peace. I'm so thankful that I can pass that truth and that relationship on to my children. You know, in my short life, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people of different walks of life. Every, nothing, my kids always say, Dad, how do you know all these? Everywhere we go, there's, hey, Neil, hey, Neil. Like, I, I guess we've just been here a while. I don't know. Um, and somebody once told me, Neil, you can make friends with that paint over there. Like, you just could talk to, oh, well, I don't know. It must be a gift from God because you used to not know how to make friends. But now, I don't know. Anyway. But all that to say, my kids have this wonderful opportunity, as I did from my dad, to be introduced to Jesus, the source of life and truth and joy and peace. And I want to live as long as I can to see my kids do well and to see my mission complete. And there's only one person that knows when that's finished. I don't have the right to my dates, birth and death. Those belong to God. But he gives me an element of influence over my dash. What I'm going to do with it. It gives you the same. I say live it well. Live it for Christ. See people come to know him. Find out who they are. And be a little, be a little magical. Does that make sense? Like Magic Johnson? Like help other people find out who they are and see them do well. It's the greatest joy you'll ever experience. Let me give you one silly illustration and then we'll close. I'm not propagating that this is a wonderful business to follow and like, oh, now buy skateboards from these people. But in the 80s, there was this skateboard organization. I guess you call it an organization. Do skateboards organize? I don't know. But there was this business called Powell Peralta. It's an amazing story. There's like this video you can watch about how it all came together. But Stacy Peralta, who is a, a, a legend in his own right for skateboarding, developed this team called the Bones Brigade in the 80s, and early 90s, I guess. And these gentlemen started when they were young, and they became the inventors of much of what is now modern-day skateboarding. And in this documentary I watched recently, Stacy Peralta, who's not a Christian, said, you know, I found so much joy in helping these kids become who they were created to be. He said, in fact, I got more joy out of their careers than I ever did living for my own. And he stops the video and goes, wow, I just realized that, like as it was coming out of his mouth. And you know who he invested in? You may not know anything about skateboarding, but odds are you've heard the name Tony Hawk. 
That's one of the kids he invested in. And he said, I didn't want to create Stacy Peralta's Tony Hawk. I wanted Tony to be Tony. And there's some truth in that. That when you don't live for yourself or your name or your fame or your glory, but you say, God, what can you do with that person? How can I help them? How can I help them be who God's called them to be? Hey, God, what about this person? How have you wired them? How have you gifted them? How can they be all that God you've called them to be? You know what you finally begin to experience? A little pep in your step, a little bit of joy. You know why? Because your perspective is Jesus and others. And about five seconds later, it's about you again. Oh, no, 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 Jesus, five seconds. Oh, no. That's the managing, the gospel, the growth, the gather, the group, the go. That's how you manage that. But you want joy? Look at all these individuals around you. Prioritize them over yourself. Live that way. Challenging circumstances, people, and crises, however you say that, can be the cause for a catastrophic killjoy. It can be. Or the catalyst. It's up to you. Because Jesus is the key to joy. And whether you like it or not, challenging circumstances people and crises, what's the word we're going to use for second service? Don't tell them I I had to learn it first service. They're coming for you whether you want them or not. You don't get to opt out. You don't get to audit life. Challenge is coming your way. Aren't you glad you came to church, right? Circumstances, people, and crises, they're coming for you. How will you respond? Will they be your catastrophe or your catalyst? The source is Jesus, always, only, ever about Jesus. He's the source of joy. But he's going to use these things in your life, like a potter would clay, to form you in who you're supposed to be. It's a singleness of mind, as this guy would say. If you're in our connect groups that are sermon-based, highly encourage you to grab one of these little resources. So helpful. But Wearsby would say in chapter one, we see that Paul had a singleness of mind when it came to challenge. It's about him and about them. It's about knowing him and making him known. And that led to joy. 